I pray that you will hear the voice of God speaking to your heart, not only to your mind, but to your entire being. Um, this study was actually, I can say, one of the first studies that helped me to see who God truly was. And so with that said, um, I'm going to invite you to all kneel, those who are able, so that we can pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Jehovah, for another blessed Sabbath. I pray that you may speak through me. I pray that you may prepare our minds and our hearts to receive your word and that we may be richly blessed and motivated to continue in our walk alongside with you. We pray and we ask these things in the name of Jesus, your precious son. Amen. <clears throat> the Bible text that we read mentions the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. And indeed, when we get a, a good grasp of, of God and the mission that he sent um, his son, I believe that we can get a glimpse, a good view of what that love really is. I dare to say that um, we probably, because of our finite minds, don't really grasp the depth of God's love. But I pray that it is enough for you to continue to be loyal to him. We're all familiar with the following verse. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him may not be lost but have eternal life. I've seen in the past as I was, um, I would watch sports, especially football, and you'd see this um, billboards. Someone has a billboard usually in football games. And most of the time it would be this verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So everybody, or at least a large majority of people, have not only seen but read this verse. That God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. Well, this translation here, the New Century Version, reads that he gave his one and only son. Now, God has many sons, some by creation and we by adoption. But this reminded me of um, Abraham. When Jehovah told Abraham, take your son, your only son, and then adds the words, whom you so love. And travel to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will designate to you. In Genesis 22 two. Now, was Isaac Abraham's one and only son? No. And so it reminded me of this verse when I read this version, where God, or here it expresses that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And the reason why I believe it says that, says that is because Christ is unique, being that he is God's only begotten son. Before the Father, he pleaded, this is referring to Jesus, in the sinner's behalf. 
While the host of heaven awaited the result when an intensity of interest that words cannot express, long continued was that mysterious communion, the council of peace. For the fallen sons of men, the plan of salvation had been laid before the creation of the earth, for Christ is a lamb foreordained before the foundation of the world. Yet, it was a struggle, even with the king of the universe, to yield up his son to die for the guilty race. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Oh, the mystery of redemption, the love of God for a world that did not love him. Who can know the depths of that love which passeth knowledge? So it was a struggle, even with the king of the universe, to give, to hand over his only begotten son for those who did not love him. But eventually he did. Why? Because he loved you and I. The counsel between the Father and the Son finally came to a conclusion. Jesus would come and die for the guilty race. And this, of course, was the counsel between them both, the Father and his beloved Son. The giving up of the Son of God was not an easy task. God knew what awaited his dear son and what risk was involved in sacrificing his son for the human race. Was there a risk? So a human body was prepared for him, one similar to the ones whom he was sent to deliver from sin. Not a special body, but one like yours and mine. So, a body you have prepared for me. We read, Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Again, a body similar to those who he, whom he came to save. And the word was made what? Flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So according to this passage, the word was made flesh. What kind of flesh? For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, referring to Christ, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. The next verse reads, For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he did what? Condemned sin in the flesh. Because Jesus had our very own nature, he was able to experience temptation. And we're going to read more on that later. But made himself, referring to Christ, of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Philippians 2.7 But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So again, we are sons or children of God by adoption. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 16 through 18, we read, For verily he took not... On him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. 
Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. In how many things? All things. That he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. To make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. So he knows what temptation is like because he experienced temptation. In John chapter 6, verse 28, we read, Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. This is very interesting. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Jesus is saying that Moses gave you bread, but my Father has given you the true what? Bread. Verse 38. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Verse 41. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. What is he talking about? Verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Now notice the following verse, verse 58. This is that bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eat it of this bread shall live forever. And verse 62, what and if ye shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he was, where? Before. Is Jesus trying to tell them that he is divine and God's son? I believe he was. Notice what we read. And the Father himself, which has what? Sent me, hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. He refers to God as his Father, my Father, and him who sent me from heaven. But the Jews would not believe it. The testimonies have the following to say. Notice, it is important that we each study to know the reason of the life of Christ in humanity and what it means to us. Why the Son of God left the courts of heaven why he stepped down from his position as commander of the heavenly angels, who came and went at his bidding, why he clothed his divinity with humanity, and in lowliness and humility came to the world as our Redeemer. Did he put away his divinity? He clothed his divinity with humanity. In these words is announced the fulfillment of the purpose that had been hidden from eternal ages. Christ was about to visit our world and to become incarnate. He says, A body has thou prepared me. Had he appeared with the glory that was his with the Father before the world was, we could not have endured the light of his presence, that we may behold it and not be destroyed. The manifestation of his glory was what? Shrouded, his divinity was veiled with humanity, the invisible glory in the visible human form. So, although we, were all, we are all tempted, there's a temptation that Jesus went through, and that was to use his divine power. Something, of course, that we don't have. God, and who else? Christ, knew from the beginning of the apostasy of Satan and of the fall of Adam through the deceptive power of the apostate. The plan of salvation was designed to redeem the fallen race, 
to give them another trial. Christ was appointed to the office of mediator from the creation of God, set up from everlasting to be our substitute and surety. Before the world was made, it was arranged that the divinity of Christ should be enshrouded in humanity. A body, said Christ, has thou prepared me. But he did not come in human form until the fullness of time had expired. Then he came to our world, a babe in Bethlehem. Praise God for that. A way is open before everyone in the office to engage from the heart directly in the work of Christ and the salvation of souls. Christ left heaven and the bosom of his Father to come to a friendless, lost world to save those who would be saved. He exiled himself from his Father and exchanged the pure companionship of angels for that of fallen humanity, all polluted with sin. So what did Christ leave? He left his crown, his kingdom, purity, holiness, love, peace, and harmony for this world. And what did he receive here? The opposite. Instead of obedience and reverence, he was mocked. He was bitten. He was spit on and finally executed to death. He exchanged all that he had for this, for you and for me. He had to endure temptation because a human body was prepared for the Son of God. He would experience the pulls of the human flesh, sinful flesh. We read, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in how many points tempted? In all points tempted. Like who? Like as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus was in all points tempted. Yet the Bible continues to read that he did not sin. How was Eve tempted? Was Eve tempted differently from, uh, from how we are tempted? Did Eve have sinful flesh? No. Her humanity hadn't, had not fallen. She was tempted by the serpent who she saw and heard. But how are we tempted? If you're like me, I, I don't need any exterior temptation. I could be in my room where there's walls and they're clean, nothing to tempt me. But temptation comes from within. So how is mankind tempted? Well, we read, every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his what? His own lust and enticed. That's how we are tempted. Now notice, the Christian is to realize that he is not his own, but that he has been brought with a, with a price. His strongest temptations will come from where? From within. For he must battle against the inclinations of the natural heart. When someone insults you, the inclination is to retaliate. And it's good to be mindful that we are slaves to Christ. And Christ tells us not to re retaliate with evil, but rather to pay evil with what? Good. We are told, cast yourselves helpless, unworthy upon Jesus and claim his very promise. The Lord will hear. He knows how strong, the, how strong are the inclinations of the natural heart, and he will help in every time of temptation. 
the Lord knows how strong are the inclinations of the natural heart. Notice, the temptations to which Christ was subjected were a terrible what? Reality. As a free agent, he was placed on probation. Jesus was on probation. He was placed on probation with liberty to yield to Satan's temptations and work at cross purposes with God. If this were not so, if it had not been possible for him to fall, he could not have been tempted in all points as a human family is tempted. Our Lord was tempted as man is tempted. He was capable of yielding to temptations as are human beings. The divine nature combined with the human made him capable of yielding to Satan's temptations. To suppose that he was not capable of yielding to temptation places him where he cannot be a perfect example for man. And the force and the power of this part of Christ's humiliation which is the most eventful, is no instruction or help to human beings. The thought or the theory that Jesus was different from ours, what hope does that give me? The following quote, really, when I first read it, I was in awe. I'm sure that many of you have read the following statement, but notice what it says. The Son of God in His humanity wrestled with the very same fears, apparently overwhelming temptations that assailed men. What are these? Temptations to indulgence of appetite, to presumptuous venturing where God has not let them, and to the worship of the God of this world to sacrifice an eternity of bliss for the fascinating pleasures of this life. Everyone will be tempted, but the word declares that we shall not be tempted above our ability to bear. We may resent and defeat the wily foe. So Jesus himself was tempted to venture where God does not lead, to indulge in appetite, And to worship the God of this world and enjoy its pleasures and sacrifice eternal life. Aren't we tempted in those areas at one point in our our life? Finally, betrayed into the hands of sinners to be executed. And of course, when he was executed, we know that the Son of God died. And he was buried. The Bible states, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost or the breath. And when Jesus cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first and of the other which were crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs, but one of the soldiers with the spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. So again we read that he was dead already so according to the bible the bible's testimony is that the son of god died ellen white says christ took upon himself the nature of humanity to make it possible for him to suffer and to die as a propitiation for the sins of the fallen race so did jesus die He experienced death. The spirit of Jesus slept in the tomb with his body and did did not wing its way to heaven, 
there to maintain it separate, a separate existence and to look down upon the mourning disciples embalming the body from which it had taken flight. All that comprised the life and intelligence of Jesus remain with his body in the sepulcher. All. And when he came forth, it was as a whole being. He did not have to summon his spirit from heaven. He had power to lay down his life and to take it up again. I'm not sure if I added this quote. But this quote from Sister White says that when Christ was hanging on that tree and the Father separated from him, the angels were in amazing grief. We, we, we cannot, um, it's hard for us to even maybe grasp that. But this was their commander, their their love, their, who they worship, who they love, God's begotten Son. And when they saw the Father separating from Him, I cannot express it in words. The risk factor of Jesus would have failed. There was a risk, and we'll read about it. To the honor and glory of God, his beloved son, the surety the substitute was delivered up and descended into the prison house of the grave. The new tomb enclosed him in its rocky chambers. If one single sin had tainted his character, the stone would never have been rolled away from the door of his rocky chamber, and the world with this burden of guilt would have perished. That means that if Jesus would have failed, God would have lost his only begotten son. Never can the cost, you see that? Never can the cost of our redemption be realized until the redeemed shall stand with the redeemer before the throne of God. So not even now. Then, as the glories of the eternal home burst upon our enraptured senses, we shall remember that Jesus left all this for us. That he not only became an exile from the heavenly courts, but for us took the risk of failure and eternal loss. You are very much, to God, you are worth In giving his son. What else can I say? Christ has found his pearl of great price in lost, perishing souls. He sold all that he had to come into possession, even engaged to do the work and run the risk of losing his own life in the conflict. One man may be required of God to do a work and stand in a position that is peculiarly trying and taxing. The Lord has a work for him to do, and he risks his life, his future eternal life, refusing to stand in that place. She continues, this was the position Christ occupied when he came to our world, entering into conflict with the rebel leader of the fallen angels. God devised a plan, and Christ accepted the position. He consented to meet the foe single-handed, as every human being must do. He was provided with all the heavenly powers to aid him in this great conflict. And man, if he walks in the way and will of God, is provided with the same keeping power. The same heavenly intelligence minister unto those who shall be heirs of salvation that they may overcome every temptation, great or small, as Christ overcame. All along, the angels of God were around Christ. 
And we also have the angels of God at our disposal. But the angels of God will leave us. You know that, right? If we continue in rebellion and sin and go into places where they dare not enter. In 1895, she reminded Seventh-day Adventists of the following. Remember that Christ risked all, tempted like as we are, he staked even his eternal existence upon the issue of the conflict. Remember, don't forget. Jesus was loyal and true to the end. Praise God for that. Though Christ humbled himself to become man, the Godhead was still his own. His deity could not be lost while he stood faithful, faithful and true to his loyalty. Was there a condition to his Godhead or divinity? Yes. According to this statement, yes. He had to remain faithful and true, loyal and true to his Father. Think of how much it costs Christ to leave the heavenly courts and take his position at the head of humanity. Why did he do this? Because he was the only one who could redeem the fallen race. The Son of God stepped down from his heavenly throne, laid off his royal robe and kingly crown, and clothed his divinity with humanity. He came to die for us, to lie in the tomb as human beings must and to be raised for our justification, he came to become acquainted with all the temptations wherewith man is beset. Finally, the Father resurrects his Son. We read, For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and that he was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that, he was seen of, of above 500 brethren at once of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. Paul an apostle, not of man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to his word, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, and set him as his own right hand in the heavenly places. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. And in Colossians 2.12 we read, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Therefore does my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it, up, take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my Father. So we see according to the scriptures, God the Father resurrected His Son. Amen. And there's a scripture, and we just read it, and there's another one where Jesus said, they destroy this temple. And what else did He say? And I will raise it up in three days. And He was referring to His body, correct? To Himself. 
And so many of us grab that scripture and never mind the rest. And that's what many, many of our evangelical friends do, correct? They grab one or two scriptures and never mind the rest. But there's perfect harmony in the word of God. And according to the scriptures, Christ died. And we're going, to, we're going to read the following quote from the Spirit of Prophecy. Notice what she says. When the voice of the mighty angel was heard at Christ's tomb, saying, Thy Father calls thee, the Savior came forth from the grave by the life that was in himself. Now notice, now was proved the truth of his words. I lay down my life that I might take it again. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. Now it was fulfilled the prophecy he had spoken to the priests and rulers. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. So he prophesied. And the father awoke his son through an angel. And this angel appeared at his tomb and said, Christ or referring to Jesus, your father calls thee. And Jesus arose. Are we not, haven't we read that we, by God's grace, our names will be called, and we also will resurrect to eternal life? I pray that that could be our experience, but we must be loyal and true just like Christ was. And that's a high standard. That is a very high standard. But it's possible. The face they look upon is not the face of mortal warrior. It is the face of the mightiest of the Lord's host. This messenger is he who fills the position which Satan fell. It is he who on the hills of, the, of Bethlehem proclaimed Christ's birth. The earth trembles at his approach. The hosts of darkness flee. And as he rolls away the stone, heaven seems to come down to the earth. The soldiers see him removing the stone as he would a pebble. And hear him cry, Son of God, come forth. Thy father calls thee. They see Jesus come forth from the grave and hear him proclaim over the Ren sepulcher, I am the resurrection and the life. As he comes forth in the majesty and glory, the angel hosts bow low in adoration before the Redeemer and welcome him with songs of praise. Wow. How beautiful. Who was this angel? Gabriel. And he moves this stone as it was a, a pebble. And he has that privilege to wake up the Son of God. Wow. Alan Robinson, a granddaughter to Sister, Sister White, she recalls the following. And she said this. I believe Alan White was actually talking of some portions of what we have shared um, this morning. And notice what she says. Ooh, I went too fast. I apologize. Okay. I see Grandma standing in the pulpit dressed in her losing in her loose fitting black sack suit narrow cuffs of white narrow white collar secure at the throat by a small brooch she's been telling of the matchless love of Christ and suffering ignominy and death and even running the risk of eternal separation from his father in heaven 
by taking upon himself the sins of the world. She pauses, looks up, and with one hand resting on the desk and the other lifted heavenward, she exclaims in a ringing voice, O oh Jesus, how I love you, how I love you, how I love you. There is a deep hush. Heaven is very near. And she says that because she realized the price and the risk for her. And I hope and pray that you may experience the same. That God gave all in giving his only begotten son. And that Jesus gave all to coming, to come to this earth, to die for you and for me. I pray that this could stimulate you, strength to strengthen your relationship with both God and his son. For they love you dearly. And that you may continue to be loyal and true is my prayer and my desire. And the same, of course, for myself and for my family. Thank you. And with this, I'm going to invite you to kneel once again to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending your only begotten Son to die for me. I pray that you will help us to be loyal and true to you and to your dear Son. Thank you, Lord Jesus for overcoming and your words ring in my mind in the world you will have tribulation but be of good cheer I have overcome the world thank you my Lord and dear Heavenly Father once again I just ask that you give us the strength to continue on that we may conquer all sin and that we may follow in the footsteps of your dear son. We thank you and we ask that you continue to be with us throughout the, the rest of this Sabbath day is my prayer in the name of your dear begotten son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.